You are not the first to pass this way, nor shall you be the last. And I can assure you that all time owners have been securely locked on those coordinates. That's right. See? Securely locked. <laughs> Journey with us now to the dawn of recorded time as we explore the amazing story of human communication. W Radio, your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 567, and I'm here once again not only to help you have the best possible vacation experience when you go to the Disney parks, but I also want to bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are, not just with the podcast, but with my live video broadcast on Facebook every Wednesday night. Videos, blogs, special events, books, audio tours, and more. Whether it's your first time visiting the parks or you've been hundreds of times, if you're planning a vacation or just love the history, secrets, stories, and details, there's something in the show for you because each week, I'm going to take you from the parks to the screens and everything in between. And if you're a new listener, welcome. Thank you for listening. Please go back and check out some or all of the past episodes for interviews, top tens, reviews, and more. And subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. Find everything over at www.radio.com. So as we celebrate the past, present, and future of Epcot Center, the park's anniversary on October 1st is the perfect time to look back on some of the milestone moments in the park's history that continue to make Epcot Center the unique, memorable, and beloved park it's always been. So this week, we're going to explore the attractions, shows, events, characters, openings, and closings that we fondly remember, and a few that we may have even forgotten in our top 10 moments in Epcot history. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, and I'll pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Stay tuned to the end of the show. I'll have more information about our upcoming WW Radio events, Meets of the Month, the stories, social, and live video I'll be sharing from Japan starting this weekend, your voicemails, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. As we celebrate the future, hand in hand, and the anniversary of Epcot Center, which is what I'm always going to call it, I thought it would be fun not to just think about what's coming, but to look back on some of the milestone moments that made Epcot Center the unique, memorable, and beloved park it has always been. From its initial concepts in Walt Disney's imagination, to the genesis of early plans and designs, there was always going to be something special about this place. And through the years, there were moments and milestones, attractions, shows, events, openings, and closings that we fondly remember, and some we may have fondly forgotten. So this week, in celebration of the dream that became the park, we are going to look at our top 10 moments in Epcot Center history. And it might be anything from the opening of a new attraction to the closing of one, a character, a show, a special event, celebrity narrator, or Tim Foster's first ride on El Rio del Tiempo. And speaking of little Timmy Foster, it wouldn't be a top 10 without Tim Foster. So joining me from the CelebrationsPress.com headquarters in beautiful rural Pennsylvania, little Timmy Foster. Rural Pennsylvania. I have no clue where you live. So. You've never been to my house. <laughs> you know, you've never invited me, and it's probably a good thing that I, I'll. You know what? I have yeah. visions in my mind's eye of what your house looks like. It's part Willy Wonka's factory. It's part creepy Dutch. I'm not going to go into the details of what I envision your house looking like uh, because we don't do video when we do these calls. No, no, but you're not wrong. I'll just say that. 
So but no. All right. So let's. <laughs> I, I really want to get right into this because obviously I am all about the Epcot feels as we've just celebrated the anniversary. And that's sort of what got me thinking, especially with the outpouring of emotion, both in terms of, of sadness to see things like Illuminations go, in joy of, in seeing and hearing some of the familiar songs that we grew up with from Epcot Center in the Epcot Forever show. And that's why I thought it would be fun to look back on some of those top 10 moments throughout Epcot Center's history. And I'm going to start by eliminating something right off the bat. Oh, come on. (laughs) I only have four. Right. Well, and if this happens to be something on your list, forget everything I'm about to say. But I think I think we should kind of leave the obvious Epcot elephant in the room out. I think the opening on, on October 1st, 1982 is... And look, without going too far down this wonderful little rabbit hole, we're all at least somewhat aware of Epcot's origins, the original intent, and it is the first non-Magic Kingdom Disney theme park in the world. Not to mention that at the time, it was the single most expensive private construction project in the world. A little bit of fun fact from my trivia book days, but I think... You know, trying to to talk about the opening um, and what it what it was um, is almost too obvious unless it's on your list. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Uh, see, <laughs> now you, you're down to this three. Is new, <laughs> this is a new one for you. Usually, you just steal mine. Now you're just throwing them out. So you I'm might listen, as well. I'm, start I'm a giver. I'm happy to help now. any way that I can. <laughs> well, why don't you? St- well, this is because I have no idea where I'm. You're going. I'm going. And well, that's why I, I want to hear. Might have been a personal one in there. I, I, I would, and I think there there can and probably should be personal ones um, in here. So I'm curious in terms of where your mind went first when you thought about a top ten moment in Epcot Center history. Well, it went from. Uh, gee, does he want me to talk about my favorite moments? Oh, and by the way. Um, November 12th, uh, 19, uh, uh, two, nine, d- d- really? oh. <laughs> was my first El, Del, El Rio del Tiempo journey. That was on my list. And you threw that one out right away. So I wasn't sure. <laughs> now I was talking between personal ones and real ones and you throw out my real ones. So, uh, well, and I think, and I think that, you can mix, I can, you, you're, you're, no, listen, have, but, but you can mix and match. One. I'm I'm just going to I'm just going to like uh, go we're going to ease into this cuz I I thought of this one on the way home and this is an absolutely 100% personal Epcot historical date for me but it means nothing to the rest of the Disney community so I'm going to start out with this one cuz you can't steal this from me that's why I'm going to start out with this one August 11 2004 an historic day in the Foster family in the daddy daughter evolution of our Disney love was the day that my daughter bought her kimono at the Mitsukoshi department store. And the only reason I know this is because I found a picture of it and I found the date that I took it. And it was in 2004. So there. All right, that one aside. <laughs> let's move on to the next one. Um, all right, see, I'm going to trample all over your rule. That's fine. And I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to go for the opening date, but I was trying to. I got the crack celebrations research team together, cats, and we were trying to figure out like the genesis of the idea of Epcot, which goes way, way, way back, well before, obviously, way before 1982, way before Walt Disney World was even built and so forth. And uh, the the earliest I found, which I thought was kind of cool. And it was kind of a vague. It was going all the way back to 1948 when uh, Walt Disney was riding on a train from Chicago's railroad fair. Because, you know, Walt loves his railroads and his trains and so forth. But he was remarking to his travel partner, Ward Kimball, that he couldn't understand why people lived in crowded cities. I take it like Chicago, although he, that wasn't in the quote. But um, – couldn't understand why people had lived in crowded city, why, why they put up with the, the noise, the pollution, the, the crowd and all that kind of stuff. And as best I could find, that's, that's probably the earliest genesis I could find of 
the seeds of a city of the future being planted in Walt Disney's mind. And of course, he would go on to expand on that and keep focusing on it as uh, you know, Tomorrowland was being built in Disneyland. And whilst that was going on, he could be seen walking around with books on planning cities and so forth and would, you know, line his shelves with them and, and so forth. And uh, progressed all the way up to the announcement on November 14th, 65. Right, right after little Timmy Foster was born. Happy birthday to me, by the way. Thank you, Lou. And um, when he was formally announced the Florida Project in its entirety, including Epcot, and which, of course, evolved to 1982, which you threw out the window before I even got to it. But um, that was the earliest reference I could find to Walt Disney having the idea for a city. And I, and I do ask you, Lou, I don't know that that's what I found i don't know if you know any other maybe earlier incarnations of when he had this idea floating around in his brain somewhere that or sounds not. good to me so be i'm gonna go a far be good? it All right, far be it from me I thought, it was a neat, I thought it was a neat story so far be it for me to uh to contradict timmy foster and you, the crack you research did, team you did you did good boys they're going to eat so. <laughs> you're talking about your cats again aren't you you're talking about the cats yeah just Look, I think it's, I think we all as as entrepreneurs have have had many occasions where we talk to our cats. The, there's a fine line between those oh. that actually answer back uh, and those that don't, and, and that's where the um, yeah. Well, they're the doing the second part of the show because I got stuff to do. So. Well, it's very interesting because uh, neither of the things that you mentioned were, thank God, were on true. my list. <laughs> <laughs> neither were on my list. I, I went um, in in slightly very 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 different directions i thought about moments in epcot history that were milestones in terms of what they represented maybe there was a personal affinity for it to sort of bring back memories uh maybe it was something that opened or that had closed and or, or maybe just something that was interesting and funny because i think epcot uh, uh, really when it opened the quote unquote most serious, right, of, of all the parks and the lands. I mean, there was a serious message, there was serious technology, there was serious obviously investment. But there were a lot of very fun and funny and interesting. I mean we look we can do top ten funny we top ten weird things to ever uh show up in Epcot. And some of those things will actually be on my list because I started walking as I started mentally walking through the years of Epcot. I was like, wow, that was a bizarre choice. And I almost put one of them first, but I won't. I'm going to save some of the uh, the, the I'm going to steal it from you. I know exactly what you are going to what you're going to steal from me. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm trying to decide if the one that I think is most significant, I should do first or I should do last. Um, mm. And I'm going to, you know what? I was going to save it as my final. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it be first because okay. I am just fearful that you're going to like the, what little <laughs> research that you've done. This is going to be the one that you steal. Well, I said, I'm only down to two things. So that's got to be one of them. It's that and I, I'm going to start off with a quote. Ooh. Quote, we feel very strongly that Mickey's home is is in the Magic Kingdom. Epcot is more of an adult attraction. We think the audience might be a little different. We're going to have characters and merchandise, but not necessarily the ones we've grown up with. Along with Figment, we're going to introduce a product line based on the Sperry Rand Robot review leader, Smart One. And the quote from Paul Bellow, who was the director of merchandise at Epcot Center, um, uh, continued on but the point of that quote was as i'm sure you are well aware when epcot center first opened there was not just one but many disney characters that were, that were glaringly absent including and most notably mickey mouse the idea was that they wanted to really keep the parks very very separate and distinct from one another and as the quote said Mickey Mouse was only really seen in Magic Kingdom and throughout the resorts. And w although he did show up for the grand opening on October 1st, 1982, he was not seen or heard from again for years. And things really only changed once Michael Eisner, 
came into uh, his role as chairman of the board of the Walt Disney Company. The this legendary story goes that that he comes to visit Epcot Center again, this incredibly important and expensive um, theme park. And as he did with all of the domestic parks at the time, he went in, and and I love this about him. And and if you can if you go back and listen to our discussion of um, the Disney decade and a lot about what Michael Eisner did, he came to visit the park as a tourist. He rode every attraction. He went to every pavilion. I, I don't think he probably ate at every restaurant. That's what I do when I go. But he goes into places like Communicore and the Centorium, which you may or may not hear again on the list, which was the largest store, not just in Epcot, but in Walt Disney World. And among other things that he wasn't happy about, he was not thrilled about the um, the the not just the selection of the merchandise, but I think the quality of it as well. And the first thing that he noted was that there wasn't enough stuff for kids, right? You know, again, this is Walt Disney World. There was, he understood having the merchandise that was tied to this idea of edutainment and talked to some of the designers and said, look, you know, the pavilions here don't necessarily lend themselves to coming up with whimsical fun plushes etc because everything's pretty education oriented and from that he's like well wait a minute you know where's mickey where's goofy where are where are where's our core characters and they said no 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 michael the mickey and his friends they don't belong here they belong in the magic kingdom and he says i say nay nay um, so nay. the the, <laughs> the philosophy Wrong, changes sir. very very quickly um and some of my favorite pictures of the Fab Five are seeing them in Epcot Center in their, do you remember their silver space suits with the rainbows on them? Very shiny, very, I don't know why they were wearing space suits, but whatever. But instantly um, we saw a lot of that merchandise uh, being created specifically for Epcot with those um, costumes. So you weren't just seeing Figment, um, who when the when the attraction opened later, and yes, you're going to hear about Figment later on as well. You started to see um, Mickey and the Fab Five and other Disney characters um, throughout uh, Epcot Center, not just in Future World, even, but even uh, going into World Showcase as well. And I think it's it's a very Tim. I think this is a huge turning point moment for Epcot Center because, you know, what if, dot, 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 what if Michael Eisner never became CEO? What if that philosophy never changed just how different the park might have been? How would the guest response have been to going into this Disney theme park without anything Disney in there? Yes, you know, Figment was there and Dreamfinder were there and they have remained sort of, for the most part, save for a few gaps here and there um the only sort of uh, characters created for that park that have remained um so i think the decision to bring the disney characters in and then really sort of explode that idea later on was a fundamental that that visit that michael eisner made to epcot center and that just was a fundamental shift in this park's trajectory Was there a date on there? <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, it's 1980 something, like the Goldberg. Right. Said, right, October first, nineteen eighty something. Brilliant! I love it. That's fantastic. I don't know. That's you. You pose an interesting question. What could it have been? So, did you ever visit pre Disney characters in Epcot? No, actually, you know, one I didn't put it on here, but a significant date for little Timmy Foster is uh, uh, October of 1993, which was the first time I was in Epcot. So, wait, that was before, yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it's funny. I'm going to piggyback off of yours though, Please because do. I am going with I, I am mine is a Mickey Mouse theme. I was kind of afraid you were going this direction. But uh, opinions are mixed on this one. I didn't mind. I'm going to zip 
forward to uh, the tail end of 1999, and I apologize because I could not find the exact specific date on there. Thanks, Internet. But uh, 19, late 1999 saw the debut, speaking of our favorite mouse, of uh, the, the tallest attraction or tallest uh, theme park structure ever in Walt Disney World that wasn't tethered to the ground by Tether. And I'm speaking of you either loved it, maybe not so much, or hated it, which probably a lot of you did. I didn't care. I actually thought it was kind of cool. But the Mickey Mouse Swan made its made its debut mm. over Spaceship Earth in time for the Millennium Celebration, much to the divisive opinions <laughs> of many of the crowd. <laughs> so um, I learned to accept it which uh, was interesting. But, um, of course, it, it became, uh, in 2001, changed to, say, Epcot, inexplicably not the Epcot logo, but in some other non-discernible non script that was just random. Um, and there it stayed until 2007 for the 25th anniversary. So... Uh, but but an interesting chant and, and a jarring one. And you you were talking about bringing the characters to the parks. And I have another one that talks about characters in the park in this park too. But um, that was uh, that that probably goes down in history as one of the more well, I guess I said more, one of the more divisive things that was done to a major park icon, along with the Cinderella birthday cake, which. <laughs> don't first don't go there. Do not go. <laughs> uh, we're gonna stay away. We'll stay away from there. But um, so the one I I I was very I didn't hate it. Hate it. I wasn't angry. I just thought it was kind of weird looking. But I I got it. I got what they were doing. You know. But um, I I was uh, pleased when it came down and Spaceship Earth was returned to its former larger than life glory that it always was. Is it, it kind of got second billing to the wand in the hand after that went up, you know. But now, now it's, you know, at, as of 2007, it's back in its um, big, uh, as I said, larger than life appearance. And I do remember um, the for, first time I went to Disney uh, in 93, excepting when I went when I was very little and I don't remember. But I, I do remember when we were driving into the park on the bus we were coming around the Swan Dolphin that direction, and Spaceship Earth was the first thing I saw from the park um, before the Magic Kingdom, before the castle, anything. So we went back there, and I saw it. I knew it existed, but never saw it, and it was jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring, every adjective you can think of, and um, still moves me to this day, and uh, I kind of like it better without the wand, but there you go. So here's a trivia question for you, the wand, uh -oh. as you as you so yeah. affectionately call it, had an official it, name. Ooh. What what was it called? Stop asking Jeeves. What was it called? I I if your question would have been, did the wand have an official name? I would have gotten that wrong. So it was clearly, called the it was the called answer. the Icon Tower. Really? It was. It weighed huh. half a million pounds. It was 257 feet tall, and I, for yeah. one... I had that number. I meant to throw that number in there, but... I yeah. was not the hugest fan of it, and I'll tell you why. I, I loved the... Simpl and love, s uh, present tense, loved and love, the simplicity and the symmetry that is Spaceship Earth. And I'm yeah. also not necessarily always a fan of having things with numbers on them. Like I, I never buy a shirt that says Epcot, you know, 2019, because in a few months it's still all of a sudden like, Oh, look at that old shirt that he's still wearing. How lame is that? <laughs> so it, it originally had the 2000 on it. Um, and it sounds like there's going to be a lot of talk about the millennium celebration today. Um, yeah. They changed it. Oh yeah, I forgot to add that part too. For sorry, sorry. Folks. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so when they when they removed it in July of 2007, um, mm -hmm. they replaced it with, and I agree that that very odd choice of an Epcot font. It almost it's borderline Comic Sans. Like it was not <laughs> the one 
that I would have um, that I necessarily would have would have chosen. Um, but actually, do you remember when they took? Do you remember when they took it down and Disney auctioned off the little red reflectors on eBay? I'm so tempted to say I, I have it. It's you have one? Living room. I have it. But that's, no, see, that's cool, man. You own uh, a piece of Disney theme I, park history. I don't. I just took one of the tiles off of the bottom of Spaceship Earth. I'll never miss it. <laughs> but no. Anyway. Um, I look I, I love that exactly. you know by the time the 25th anniversary came back it, it, it looked the way it did on opening day in, in 1982 yeah. and look I think there were a lot of people that did like the Icon Tower and they did like the fact that there was a bit of Mickey and Whimsy and Disney in a theme park that was and remember Tim thinking back to when this was for a long time Epcot Center had the deserved or, or not reputation of being you know, the not fun park. It's where you went to sort of learn and, you know, where mom and dad would go and, and you know, walk around yeah. World Showcase and have a cocktail or 12. Um, you know, I think I think, <laughs> I think Siemens, um, when they came in in, in 2005 in, in this massive sponsorship deal, um, I think maybe the decision to pull the wand down had something to do with them as well. So uh, it's a piece, it, right, I, I think it's an important part of... of uh, Epcot Center history, not necessarily my favorite part as well. But what it does afford me the opportunity to do is keep this Millennium Celebration Yay! train a rolling. Insert <laughs> choo choo sound here, because look when this when this happened, and it's funny because I actually happened to be talking to my son the other day about the Millennium, because there was something on TV about um, the Y two K you know scare, and he had no idea. What I, what it, what the show was talking about, and I explained to him what the millennium, you know, what the Y two K buzz and and scare was, and it was a big deal. You know, millennium was was a big deal for a lot of reasons, and and Walt Disney World's millennium celebration, I think, was even more so special in Epcot because it was and it remains a park, even as as it's shifting right or sort of going backwards to look forward. It's about the future it's about you know like i said in the intro it's you know celebrating the future hand in hand it's about our ability as human beings to come together peace on earth is like actually attainable and they wanted to drive that home in in wonderful ways and i think one of the ways they did it that was one of my favorites and to me is a it was a milestone moment in Epcot Center history was the Tapestry of Nations Parade. Yes. Also debuting on October 1st, 1999, along with everything else that was part of the Millennium Celebration and Epcot's, to do the math, 17th anniversary. It was, I think, not only this, not only really the first parade in Epcot, this, there was a very short-lived World Showcase Parade. We'll get to that later on. But this one was created specifically for this Millennium Celebration, which, as you know, in Disney World is never 12 months. This one was 15. And it was huge, right? There was 150-plus performers and giant puppets. And the whole mission was to sort of celebrate humanity and, and this human spirit and was in development for like three years. I mean, this was one that was not sort of brought together very, very quickly. This is one that there was it was very intentional and very well thought out. This idea in terms of of this message of we making peace with our neighbor sitting next to us on the parade route, our neighbor next door at home and our neighbors across the planet came across in such a beautiful way through the puppetry. The score is just phenomenal it's one of the few things like i don't have a lot of music on my iphone this is one of the parades that i have our millennium drums the heartbeat of the human spirit now call the nations of the world together the human spirit cannot stop will not stop it is the spark that lights the flame of life that lives forever rejoice Tapestry of magic. Endless possibilities await. Behold. 
behold the great millennium walk it was beautiful to watch it was incredibly um uh, tranquil um i remember how interactive it was in terms of with some of the younger guests and i and we've talked about this on past shows about the sage of time being this representative piece and the bird people um and the incredible costumes um which need to sort of be called out because michael curry who also helped design the costumes if you ever seen lion king on Broadway, he's also done Finding Nemo and Frozen and things like that. Um, obviously, remarkably talented. But this parade, Tim, was so different than any of the other parades we as guests had ever seen in this park or even Magic Kingdom. It was unique um, in in every stretch of the word. Um, and I think the the way that we use the word interactive and, and experiences all the time. This parade was more than just something that passed in front of you. Uh, it, it stopped along the route and they, they interacted with you. And even the, the kinetic elements that were part of this were not only so incredibly captivating to those of us standing and, and following along and interacting on the world showcase promenade. It was so good how good was it? It was so good, they actually uh, took a version of this and used it for that Super Bowl halftime show. Do you remember that? In, I want to say the it was... One, the one we won? No, no, you guys, it, no. This was the... <laughs> it, it, it was... <laughs> don't go... To, I don't get. It was the Rams and the the Titans. Remember the last play when they he yes. stopped the Titans? Like I was snowbound in a hotel. And... Um, but and again, showing how For different. Right, yeah, look at how different that's, that's halftime cool. shows are now, where it's it's gigantic yeah. concerts. This was a spectacle. I mean, it was an absolute spectacle. Um, and and the theme, um. Was and remember, and not to go off on a tangent, but Disney had done Super Bowl shows before. There was like an It's a Small World one, there was an Indiana Jones based one uh, in the past, and this must have been so. This was Super Bowl like 34, I think. Um, and it, it was obviously incredibly appropriate to have this celebration of the millennial millennium playing during the uh Super Bowl show, and even after the millennium celebration ended. In 2001, it was changed from Tapestry of Nations to Tapestry of Dreams. The Sage of Time was now the Dream Seekers who had these butterfly nets and and, um, children would write down their dreams and put them in the nets during the parade. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. If you've never heard the Tapestry music, fire up your Spotify and check it out. Um, Again, it's a milestone parade, not just because of when it was and what it was about, and and for me, I, I loved the the pageantry and more importantly the messaging. I loved. It. I think I feel like we talked about this on the last show too. Probably Whatever because I love it about. so much. I love it too, and I've, I know we talked about this. And I won't get into this too deep. The notion of of uh, uh, like a significant time in Epcot, if it's personal, is different for everybody. Like, like right when you were talking. To me, that that's my significant earliest memories of Epcot, and and I remember my daughter. I guess she would have been five or six or seven, sitting, and because when we went to Epcot the first time, this this was how it was. So we, my first experience of Epcot was Tapestry of Nations, and that that was just there. And I remember her interacting with the the characters and the parade as they came by seeing all the children interacting and then hearing, and I would, my, I would, my tears would well up when I would hear the, the great, who's the greatest dreamer of all Lou, who's the greatest dreamer of them all. Tim Foster. Is this a trick? No. I feel like this is a trick question. No, it's not a trick no. question. It's not a trick <laughs> question. Ruth Buzzy. <sighs> Ruth Buzzy. Yeah. So I, I would cry whenever that, Part would come up and um and i know for you and i feel like you're going to get to it but uh 
the earliest days of Epcot are like are going to be more your, you know, your warmest, fondest, fondest nostalgic memories. But those are mine, Tapestry of Nations and Dreams. Because when you said that, my mind instantly went back to the time. So, yeah. Boy, that, that was a long way for nothing. But thanks for coming <laughs> along for the ride. But. <laughs> No. Uh, let's see. Is it my turn now? It um, is your turn. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I, I, I gave you a lot of time ones. to to Google something. I did. I came up with this one. Um, I uh, I man, Google, do me good on this one. So, you, we're talking about characters, and I had a character themed one too. So I'll stick with that. So, um, uh, this is so, sort of a tough one to peg down. Not not in finding the date, but finding which date you wanted to go with. Um, I had a couple. And I'm going to go with April 6, 2007. Um, that being the day in World Showcase that the Grand Fiesta Tour made its debut. And say, uh, say for an odd appearance here and there, uh, to this, to this uh, podcaster's knowledge, that, may, that was the debut of a Disney character officially into an attraction. At World Showcase, as 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 opposed to El Rio del Tiempo, which had changed, Maelstrom, the movies, and so forth. So um, now, of course, you have Frozen right next door, and uh, Ratatouille coming to France, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, I know, uh, I think we've talked about this. I'm sure you have talked about this many times. Um, the just the concept of having Disney characters in Epcot and specifically World Showcase. And actually, I do remember us talking about this uh, extensively. Uh, the pros and cons of that, whether it's it's good because it's you're in Disney and why not? It's Donald Duck and even though what he has to do with Mexico is beyond me, except, except for the three Caballeros, that makes sense. But um, versus the notion of we're – in World Showcase to be celebrating the cultures of different nations around the world and kind of Disney-fying them. Does that help that or hinder it? It's an open question, open for debate. I happen to like it. I enjoy it when they're there. Um, I, I do know, I, I was also thinking that um, World Showcase being its own date, um, I am reminded Nemo did come a few months before in arriving to the Living Seas. Same kind of idea that there's now a Disney character that's front and center, the main attraction of said attraction, as opposed to um, the discovery of imagination, communication, the seed land, whatever it was. So, um, so when you were talking about Disney characters, I kind of thought that's where you might have been going. But um, that's uh, as far as my recollection. Those are as far as official introductions into attractions and changing them from. You know, and, and I, I don't want to say an adult only one because uh, I do, I do, I think do kids find them entertaining and educational, but um, definitely Disney-fying them up a lot and taking them kind of away, not oh, totally away from the educational aspect, but kind of mixing in more of the Disney magic. Is a good thing, bad thing, great thing? I don't know. It's up to you to decide. I like it, but. Yeah, I mean it's a it, that's another conversation for another day. As, another conversation. As the but that's when it started, and then you know, so. Yeah, look, I mean there are, and I think there's not necessarily two different camps in terms of of feelings about Disney characters, animated characters coming into Epcot with things like Nemo and in World Showcase. Now we see Ratatouille. After I mean, look. You cannot deny the success of the Frozen attraction in Norway. So clearly having Disney characters is a massive guest satisfier, especially I think for those guests that are coming with young children or maybe are young children at heart. I see a lot of people riding that attraction that do not have kids. So I don't think it's necessarily just saying it's, it's only families that enjoy it. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see that. You know, the characters are not just going to be ones from Disney and Pixar films. We're seeing them from Guardians of the Galaxy um, in terms of, of yeah. what is coming. But I think Disney also, as we turn this page, they're also sort of going back to the original 
first chapters and sort of the blueprint for Epcot in terms of what we are going to see in terms of attractions, nostalgia, messaging, intent, um, story, um, and purpose of, of what is to come. So I think the next few months, years are going to be very, very interesting. We're going to look back on this time in Epcot Center's history just to see how much it changes. And again, going it, that really does go back, and that's why I did it first. It goes back to that decision by Michael Eisner to say, this is a Disney park. People expect to see Disney characters here. You get Mickey Mouse in a spacesuit and get him out there tomorrow. <laughs> I kind of imagine that's how the conversation went. I don't know Michael Eisner. I'd like to get to know Michael Eisner, <laughs> but I sort of imagine... That's how it went. Um, he may have he may have been eating a meal in Mexico and saying, "We need to get these characters in here." Stat that too, Timmy Foster. Will is a nice segue to the next milestone moment in Epcot Center history that's on my last list because you see, yeah. my friends, the yeah. computer makes life easier. It saves me time and headaches too. He sorts things out, analyzes in a shake. My enormous, I'm so tempted to sing. My enormous problem to him is a piece of cake. He's got a great big memory like, oh, I'm going to get into my really bad like Dick Van Dyke English impression. Utilizes knowledge without end. That's why I'm a router for me computer. Everybody (laughs) needs a friend. I get you, Ken Jennings and Sherman Brothers, because when I was a kid, my only friend was the computer. It's why I never dated. I'm sharing way too much personal information. However... I am obviously talking about... Make it stop. Make it stop. <laughs> Come on, man. The Astuter Computer Review is without a doubt a milestone in Epcot Center history, not just because it has the distinction of being the first original Epcot Center attraction to close because it lasted <laughs> just over a year. Rest in peace, <laughs> Ken Jenning. Uh, there's not a lot that's known about this attraction and you may have a love laugh relationship with it but so much so tim that for a long time there wasn't even any video of it remember this is 1982 not Mm. everybody was walking around well nobody was walking around with a cell phone in their pocket unless they were a time traveler nobody was walking around with a video camera in their pocket or even necessarily one on their shoulder so there wasn't a lot of video that was taken of this location and it's funny because i still get emails all the time from people like i have this weird memory of going up to this lounge on the second floor or my dad worked for sperry univac computers we went into this room and looked down on these like giant bank your memories are absolutely true because The Epcot Computer Central was sponsored by Sperry, which later became Unisys, like way back in the computer days, and was home to the Astuter Computer Review, who starred Ken Jennings, who sang it. Now, you might actually know the name Ken Jennings. Um, He was an actor. He was in Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Um, He actually received like an... uh, um, I don't know if he received it, like a Tony or something. I mean, he he did a lot of of Broadway and off Broadway shows, um, but he was in this show where he was, as we all do, sing and dance about computer systems, specifically the ones that ran Epcot. Um, and yes, your phone probably has more, probably almost undoubtedly has more computing power than the monolithic machines that were in that room, but it was located in Communicore East and it was on a second floor theater, right? So again, something incredibly unique about this attraction and it overlooked a room where some of the park's computers were housed. This was not a stage. This was not a set. It was not a screen. The real working gigantic computers which didn't look like computers. They just looked like these giant, you know, tan boxes that were just lined up in rows. And sort of, you really, I have to pull a Tim and go with me here. So what happened was oh, Ken, Ken Jennings, I'll pay you your nickel royalty. Ken Jennings was transported from the, the, the UK pavilion in World Showcase where he was performing in the pub with a monkey I'm not kidding. He was transported into... Listen, it gets weirder. He was transported into that room 
and shrunk <clears throat> down. And what else do you do when you leave your monkey behind, you're shrunk down, and you enter a computer room? You sing the computer song written by, yes, the Sherman Brothers. And they almost used it. it they used an effect that was very similar to Pepper's Ghost that you see like in the Haunted Mansion where they projected an image of Ken onto the glass and it made it look like he was really teeny tiny and walking on top of the computers. And like I said, it was a Sherman Brothers song, uh, which, you know, Mayor, my, I, I think when I I think when I interviewed Richard like years ago, I think we talked about this um, as well. But I remember um when I interviewed George McGinnis, God, this goes back like literally 10 years, he explained um, how they created and utilized that effect. And, and Tom Fitzgerald, I know, was uh, involved with the effect creation as well, which sort of which, which took place outside the, 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 the view of guests. There was also, Tim, here's a trivia question for you. During the course yeah. of the show and the one that would follow it after, there was an mm-hmm. audio animatronics figure that talked about how audio animatronics were programmed that was from another Epcot Center attraction for Ooh. for dinner at the restaurant of your choice in Walt Disney World as long as it's under 10 bucks. What audio animatronics figure was in the Astuter Computer Review? Four, Wait, was this was this a three. figure that was in another attraction? Or this figure, this attraction? character was lo- was was fe- featured featured in another Epcot Center attraction at the same time, but was in this show to demonstrate how audio animatronic figures were programmed. The Butler from Horizon. You're so close because it's not oh. even close at all. It was no. Mr. Eggs from Kitchen Cabaret. That's made up. It's not made up. It's true, I tell you. I true. still want my dinner. <laughs> I'll listen. I'm always down for dinner. You know that. I know. Um so again, we can I I I would love to sort of really, you know, go deep into this, but um it's 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 I lo- I still love this song, right? I I love the song, but but the show only lasted well, till well, January 84. Where does the song go? You see my friends the computer makes life easier <laughs> Saves me time and headaches too <laughs> He sorts things out, analyzes in a shake My enormous problem to him's a piece of cake He's got a great big memory like an elephant <laughs> Utilizes knowledge without end That's why I'm a router for me computer Everybody needs a friend <laughs> I'll sing it. I'll sing it to you after I stop recording. No, but no, no. when it closed in I tried. January, people, people, I tried. I tried to do it. When it closed, I almost started. I think I almost sang like a bar when I was saying the lines. However, because you can. All right, here for dinner anywhere you want and seventeen dollars. When the show reopened and was renamed Backstage Magic, Ken Jennings, not the guy from Jeopardy, but this Ken Jennings, was replaced by a female hostess. What was her name? Um, uh, 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 it was, um, uh, um, hold yes, on. Yes, it uh, it's Julie. Come on, Google. Come it's on, Julie. Google. And uh, she had a little sidekick by the name of Io. I slash O for input output. Slightly different version of the did show. Did you say it and I, and I walked over you? You still. It's called Io. Io. Then her little companion was Io for input output. Oh, I thought you meant like Beatrice Arthur or something. <laughs> no. What? So I don't anyway, I you met a real person. It lasted um it lasted until <laughs> I think late late ninety two, late uh ninety three. But look, it they were they kept Wait. on thinking about um uh, updating the show and and trying to look, this is a problem with Epcot, with Tomorrowland, with everything else. The, the future is a moving target, right? And it's something they learned very early on. And, and you cannot have a presentation about computers when computers are changing and were changing so rapidly. You know, by the time they wanted to um, uh, redo the show, the mainframes that were in there were probably no longer the mainframes that they were using. Plus, personal computers were now appearing on the desktop desktops of the guests at home so for them, there was a monstrous disconnect between the computers that 
ran things and now the computer that they had in in um, their home. So the show, you know, did not necessarily make sense anymore um, as computers got got so much smaller. So um, that's why I, I listen. I, I love this. Uh, I love the attraction. Um, it, I, I thought it was. I thought it was super again as a as a computer nerd I totally dug it um it was weird and it was wacky and I'm telling you go to Spotify get Spotify premium I wish oh I should have an affiliate link I'm only kidding you should go to Spotify and listen to the computer <laughs> Wait, song I'm going on Spotify go to right the now. computer it's called the computer song by Richard and Robert Sherman from 1982 Wait keep I want to find it and that's talking. why I'm a why, why, why don't you sing a little bit of this song? I, if you keep giving me time, I'm, I'm going to give you're going to give me enough rope to hang myself. So what's it called? The computer. The computer song, song by Richard and Robert Sherman. Don't hug me. I'm no, it's not. You're, I don't know what you're looking at, but you need to go next. Go ahead. What's your next one on your list? No computer song on Spotify. It's there. I'll I'll send it to you. All right. Um, I want to, uh, you were so close to breaking out in song. And you know, the people want this. Trust me. I get I know this... nobody wants this. No, they want it. And uh, if you're not going to give us that, I'm going to push you into doing something else. So I'm making this one my next one on my list. And it's uh, sort of, it's, it's a sort of a personal one, but sort of a general one too. You'll get the drift as I mentioned this. Um, December, I'm going to say it's the 6th, December 6th, 2007 is where we're going, Lou Mangiello. Well, I don't know if you were with me. I don't think you were because I remember walking around by myself, pretty sure, because once again, you didn't take me to dinner. But that's okay. But little Timmy Foster's walking around. Spaceship Earth is closed for refurbishment at this time. But... From behind the construction wall, cast member looks at you and says, you want to take a peek at we're doing a soft opening. So, yes, I go aboard. So this is when they were doing the soft opening for the renovated, uh, the refurbishment of Spaceship Earth. And that was the first time I got to see the what incredible new animatronics they had during the first part of the journey. And then, as we talk about many times, the complete redo of the second part with the new interactive screen um thankfully they kept the whole alphabet being invented by the phoenicians which we know is true because epcot said so and I'm, I'm glad that stayed but it also saw the debut of a new scene like i said most of the second attract part of the attraction was totally redone most of the first part was intact albeit with new animatronic figures, but there was a new scene, the computer scene with our favorite character. And Lou, it reminds you of somebody has a quote, a comedian that I can't get out of my mind every time I go on this attraction because it's your fault and we want to hear you say it. <laughs> Please, you're giggling. I can tell you want to. You want to so bad. Ken Jennings. Yes. No. You're just not going to do it. I'm not. I'm not. Come I'm not. On. Listen, I'm not your trained monkey. You do it. You you would do the voice. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> hey, lady. <laughs> I apologize to anybody who was wearing earbuds. I was trying to. Get, no, I was trying to get sick. No, but really, that that uh, well, no, <laughs> and that was a stupid one. So I'm going to do another one because I just wanted you to say that. I just I love to how much you love saying Epcot Center now. I do. I, I'm uh, love it. I can you know tell, me. I can, a... hear, I can hear the little the joy in your voice that you can say it again. And I got to remember to call it the right thing now. It's funny because I, I, I do in the magazine. I people writing continually want to keep calling it Ep, it Epcot Center or all cat Epcot or all capital Epcot. And now. Now that I finally gotten it figured out, now we're changing it again. So uh, you can do a whole show on the name of this park, and uh, it's a word. It's not a word. It's an acronym. It is an acronym. It's a center. It's not a center. It has a year. It doesn't have a year. Um, yeah, I'm going on the next one because I didn't like that one. So 
Um, you talked about the evolution of Epcot going forward. And I will tell you, I, I was happy to, to see, um, <clears throat> excited, very excited to see what came out of D23. Um, not sure, though, um, what was going to happen. I am very excited about what they did real, though, because um, to me, Epcot, you talked about Epcot being, having the perception of a more grown-up oriented park versus a fun theme park for kids. And I always dug that. I remember the first time I went and being totally enraptured with the idea of future world and um, the the slow moving journeys through time, through the sea, through the land, uh, hi history of uh, transportation and so forth and all that. And as they started introducing new attractions, and rumors of new attractions would come up that were more thrill oriented. Um, I always had a worry that they're going to turn my beloved edutainment Epcot into just a thrill ride park, which I will say as they announced all the things that they're going to be doing with Epcot in the coming years, thankfully doesn't sound like that's happening and they are maintaining the original, um, focus and uh, con concept of what Epcot was. And I, and I love that they're doing that. But I do, I was looking back at when the, the elements of thrill rides came in. And to me, the big one was when Mission Space came in and we all missed Horizons and I can't do Mission Space. The orange one. Green one, I'm good. Orange one, not so much. That being in 2003. But um, I was thinking back to uh, Test Track's opening and uh, March of 1999, and that being that probably being the first introduction of a bona fide thrill headliner attraction ride into Epcot, replacing a very, uh, very much a slow moving dark ride type of attraction uh, with with a thrill ride, and and I, you know, Test Track is great. Um, and it's fine, but it did it did did make you wonder. Oh no, are they going to start changing these? I remember a rumor about Spaceship Earth becoming a roller coaster, which I don't think is even possible. But I yeah, remember Project that. Gemini was a real thing. Yeah, it was a it was a thought. Well, it was see, a and thought. that was scary, and I and I would miss it, you know. Um, and I know Test Track was pre um, had. Precedent there, the Body Wars was there in 1989, Maelstrom in 1988, but Test Track was the new, the first, like I said, brand new, completely replacing this attraction with this one, and very much a thrill ride. And then, of course, Mission Space came, um, um, and I, you know, like the concept of both. You, you lost a bit of the educational, edutainment aspect of World of Motion and Horizons, of course, but you know thrills are there and and like i said it's refreshing to see they're not they're not going down that path um i didn't wasn't sure with guardians of the galaxy where we're going with all that although i'm all about guardians of the galaxy don't get me wrong but um but i love that the, the concept still of exploration discovery and imagination is still very much at the heart of epcot center and will remain so but i was thinking back to when thrill rides debuted and at various times I was excited for Mission Space when I saw it's coming, but they didn't really say what it was. And I was imagining a 15, 20 minute long dark ride through interstellar space, visiting galaxies and stuff. And we didn't get that. We just get little Timmy Foster in the engineering seat crashing the spaceship every time we land. And I apologize to everyone who's ridden with me before. It's not my fault. The buttons are in a weird place. So. Tim, I want to tell you a little story. Oh, I want gosh. you and you, my friend listener, to sit back, relax, and let me tell you a tale. Okay. I want you to imagine a Walt Disney World where it wasn't busy all the time. In oh, fact, yes. in fact, Disney may have even struggled to attract guests to the parks during certain times of year. There was a time 
where hmm. conventional wisdom was that Walt Disney World was a summer vacation destination, maybe a place to go for spring break, maybe you went for the holidays, but why would you go in October, November? There's no reason, right? There's nothing, there's no reason to go there. Correct? No, why, what, who in their right mind would go in October? And I've said that's this just, in the past, silly talk. The, the, the good old days sometimes in some respects where you could go to the parks and there literally be no one there. And I keep telling the same story because it's true of me standing in Liberty Square and looking down to front, I'm sorry, I was standing in Frontier looking towards Liberty Square and there was one other person in the frame of my shot the park was opened it was early morning but there was nobody there because that's the way it used to be and it was an issue for disney uh parks and resorts had a had a a an issue in trying to figure out how to attract guests to the parks during these very very slow times of year and how do they come up with an idea to do it, they saw what other people were doing and doing well. In fact, Disney got the idea from Colorado. Hmm. Mangello, what are you talking about? Timmy well, Foster, right. the solution, yeah. and now it's something that we take for granted, to get people to Walt Disney World was to give them a reason to come. In 1982, um, there was a um, a festival that was being held in Aspen, Colorado, and it was a food and wine classic hmm. that was being sponsored by a, a food by Food and Wine magazine, which was a which was um, a relatively new magazine at the time. It was owned by Time Magazine, if anybody still remembers what magazines are, and. Hey, well, listen, I'm just saying, right? <laughs> so they hold this festival, right? They took a chance to hold this festival, which is now, I, I think, still going on. And years after um, this festival begins in Aspen, Colorado, a Disney cast member whose name you may or may not recognize by the name of George Caligridis visits said festival in Aspen, Colorado. To fill in the gap, George Caligridis is the current president of Walt Disney World Resort. He realized he had he was at the time um uh, sort of leading Epcot and saw this this decline in attendance and some of the issues. Look, remember, decline in attendance has a very very pronounced domino effect because it affects cast members and and hiring and seasonal cast members etc so lay layoffs have to come if there's no guests that 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 require the need of of cast members and he looks at this annual event in in aspen and is like wait a minute what better place to do this than epcot center we've got the room we've got these pavilions that could showcase the finest meats and cheeses and other foods and beverages of their countries and it just made perfect sense he also noticed that locally here in central florida there was um what was something called the vintage grand tasting at the walt disney world village which is now the hilton orlando in lake buena vista and they had seminars and wine tastings and dinners and a dance and this like huge event really sort of focused on the wine portion of food and wine, he saw that not only were people coming to Hilton, they were staying at Hilton, they were spending money not just to stay there and eat there, but on some of these seminars. And he was like, wait a minute, all we need to do is scale this up. And so the very first Epcot International Food and Wine Festival was born. It was much different, right? Much smaller and shorter and simpler than it was now. Um, you know, I think sort of the idea was 
you know, 30 days, 30 nations, right? It's a very simple, I mean, obviously you wouldn't stay there for 30 days, but this idea of having these tapas style, small bites and little drinks and things like that, this was the way to not just get people to Epcot, but to stay in Epcot Center. Um, They wanted to attract not just regular guests, but more importantly, a new audience of food lovers who probably might not have gone to Disney otherwise, right? There's Disney's always had this misperception of being hot dogs and chicken nuggets, which, by the way, I love the hot dogs and chicken nuggets. However, they figure if we attract the foodies and the wine connoisseurs and we do some of these exhibits and events, wait a minute, why don't we get some celebrity chefs to come in as well, right? Yahtzee, it makes totally sense yeah. to like Rick Bayless and Bobby Flay and, you know, Robert Irvine. I mean, some of the other ones that they've had through the years to come in, it becomes, you know, it uh, again, we're not going into the the long history of it, but um, they tried the festival for a couple of years. They see it does well. They saw that there was still some attendance issues. Wait a minute. How do we what do we do now? Let's bring in a little bit of an entertainment aspect to the festival as well. There is the birth of the Eat to the Beat concert series, which is really now just a staple of the festival. And I think for some people, the attractor to the festival as well. Uh, Obviously, again, I didn't mean to sort of go ramble on it. The Food and Wine Festival ends up giving birth to the Flower and Garden Festival not long thereafter. Festival of the Arts. I mean, it, it's Epcot is Festival Central, which I love. I mean, I can almost sort of envision a festival going on, you know, almost all year long because that's sort of the way um, it is. It, so it went from what was, you know, f- I think the first one was five weeks. Oh, he, wait. Here's your boathouse dinner question. What? Who was the first I festival? Haven't won. Yeah, I haven't gotten no, close yet. Whatever. Okay. Who was who was the first Flower and Garden Festival sponsored by. Yes, Better Homes and Gardens. You well, I, are come on. brilliant. Brilliant. So, so that okay. So fair. that's a very, very, very long-winded way. You can see I get excited when I talk about food <laughs> and wine. You can see um, the Epcot International Food and Wine Festival. And thank you, George Calagridis, right? Because this wouldn't have happened without- I mean, it is no longer just it's it's not a a um, it's not an add on experience. It's not something you can do while you're here. It's the reason why people go and they stay and they eat and for some reason even run. I mean, this is now probably arguably one of the biggest non holiday specific attractors to the park. So without a doubt, milestone. But I remember you and I sitting outside the Boulangerie Petit Serie, oh. lamenting the fact that it's crowded and it's only 10 o'clock. Do you know that Julia Child? So, so, do you know that you Julia? Know. Remember what? Julia Child? Maybe you might be too young. Remember I Julia do, Child? I, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I almost just yeah, did my young. Julia Child remember. impression, which is probably worse than my, my Jerry Lewis impression. Come on. Come on. I'm, no, because I'm going to do a really do you, bad, do your, high Do your pitched... Dan Aykroyd impression of Julia. That's Trump. what I was thinking. Stuff the giblets into the chicken rice. <laughs> <laughs> there if you've you never go. seen it, that's, Google that's, the video that's, that's, of that's, Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live of uh, doing his Julia Child impression. It's hysterical, and I'm old. Sorry. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Wait, was there more to that? or is that... There is, but I'll stop now. Because my bad Dan Aykroyd Julia Child impression is probably a good enough place as any to stop. I really didn't. I think you kind of got all. But didn't we do like twelve by now? Uh, I think Are we've we only done? done three. I think we've only done. No, three. we didn't. Yeah, I no, I I did five. You know, one I had left was Lou for the privilege of buying me dinner at a restaurant I choose. Yes, ma'am. What is the significance of? Five five oh five. May fifth, two thousand five. Which is the f- opening day of Soren. Which is also uh, our anniversary. Right. 
flight. I just gone for your flight number of sort. But oh, sorry. I, I like anniversary. That's Are awesome. you done? So you have nothing left? Wait, let me see. Mickey Wand, you clobbered that one. You yelled at me about this one. You laughed at that one. I did. I The only other one I had. This is silly. June 3rd, 1988. Our anniversary? Mm, no, and thanks for remembering. I have no idea. I'm not getting anything for you. No, the only one I had left, uh, uh, rather sort of significant, June 3rd, 1988, was the grand opening of the Norway Pavilion, thus completing all the openings of the pavilions of World Showcase. Followed soon thereafter by the opening of Maelstrom on July 5th. And that has... Curiously, though, I guess been the way World Showcase has World Showcase has stayed country wise, save for uh, the pavilions uh, that would come up in food and wine and so on and so forth. But uh, all right, I, I'm going to guide. I'm gonna... Austra- that that's the. Uh... Yeah, me, that's it. Let me. Then I will guide Give me you. A quiz. Give me. I want to win something. All right. I will guide I wanna, you through. I, win I will guide you through the rest of my lists. Okay, and if the you rest. want, how many I, do you have? I have more. I love, I uh, love Epcot Center, man. I do. I love Epcot Center. All right, so I'll, I'll pull a Tim Foster, and I'll turn it into a quiz. Oh, God. And I'll well, because you've been giving me. Okay, January ninth, right, January ninth, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. Oh wait, I know that. To stop. Just do you? Yes or no? Do you know it? Stop it. Stop googling Epcot January ninth, nineteen ninety nine. Illuminations. I'll, no. I'll even I'll, I'll bookend it for you. October first, right. nineteen eighty three. It is the opening and closing dates of Horizons. Uh, of, of Horizons. What? New Horizons okay. for you and for me. Yeah. Keep going. I'm going to start singing again. Keep going. But Come I on. won't. Come on. One, two, one, two, one. Again, I, and I and I know in the past. Look, as long as you're doing the Google, look to see when I did my DSI of Horizons like eons ago. Yeah. This you attraction, this dark ride attraction, which which demonstrated what the future might hold, was built as sort of a sequel. I mean, there was definitely it was definitely tied to Carousel of Progress and this this philosophy this mantra as it were of if we can dream it we can do it has become something that which is you know just part of of uh, our, our everyday sort of sort of nomenclature because carousel of progress followed the changes of a family through the 20th century and con- horizons continued that family story showing how they might live in the 21st century right so this idea of you know, the great, big, beautiful tomorrow sort of, and which you can actually hear throughout the attraction. I loved, 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 and you can find these somewhere. You know, art deco versions and jazz versions. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow Shining at the end of every day There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow And tomorrow's just a dream away Of, um, of uh, the great big beautiful tomorrow throughout um, the Horizons attraction. Um, GE was a sponsor when they didn't renew the sponsorship. It closed in 99, eventually was demolished, replaced by Mission Space. There are definitely some tributes in Mission Space to Horizons, including that there's a some some background music in there as well as the Horizons logo. But what I loved about this attraction, and I think why to this day there is... Um, a, a sentimental attachment to it is, you know, if you think about the time frame, Tim, right? The the late '90s. So, and look, I'm a big science fiction fan, um, and I don't just mean sort of some of the you know Star Trek, Star Wars. I, I mean, look, even things like Star Trek. Sometimes the future for humanity was. You know, not necessarily wonderful. There was a lot of apocalyptic type looks and things, and even in the Star Trek future, there were there was difficulty. This um, this vision of the future, right? Much like the Millennium Celebration and the Tapestry of Nations, and and um, 
this this wonderful vision of what life was going to be like and how we as guests, you know, could have this choose your adventure moment, right? We had those little like a moment, and I don't mean like the descent of Spaceship Earth when you're sort of going through the cartoon commercial. When you had to choose through space and underwater and desert and really get a sense of what the real future might be um, was something that was, I think, we look back now with such a fondness for the attraction. But again, I keep calling it, it's the ex-girlfriend effect, right? When you know something's going to close, you're like, no, 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 don't go away. I love you so much. That's what happened with Horizons. Horizons was never an incredibly popular in terms of guest attendance attraction until Disney said, we're about to close it. And then people are like chaining themselves to the foliage out front. Not that you can chain yourself to foliage, but go with me here. Um, I loved um, what Horizons stood for. I love the ride vehicles. I love the music. I love the the scenes. You can find tons of great videos online for it as well. I, um, I'm pretty sure Jeff Lang, I think if you go to JeffLangDVD.com, he has a great video tribute to Horizons as well. Um, look, and even today, Tim, there is still this... Um, incredible sentiment towards that attraction. I mean, go to, to any D23, Destination D, any Disney-related event, um, the, the, there's always going to be talk of Horizons. Almost as much, I'm going to segue mm. here, unless you have something to add about Horizons. No, you can segue among yourself. You never read You never even wrote it. Almost, there was almost as it. much love of Horizons as there was for the magical world of Barbie show. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Look, I think it's a milestone moment. L- no, literally. No. Not- I, you're right. I, I'm going to let you go. I'm just going to say this is hysterical because I mentioned to somebody I was going to do this. And my, this, this, it's pathetic. I, but the person I told did say... They brought up at the world of Barbie. You're going to talk about that, right? I said, yeah. But here you are. Here I am. Talk about, about Barbie. It. When look, look at I, this. Here I, it's He's Horizons, so Tapestry of Nations, Sherman Brothers, and Barbie's Barbie. <laughs> Barbie. And Barbie's birthday party in Epcot 94. They were so, <laughs> and I'm not going to go too deep into it. I know we talked about this on, on an earlier show, but this was like this. If you wanted to scream mid 90s this is it man it's it's mid 90s epcot center gold like yeah from every just you need to google the video right so so basically barbie was the ambassador of friendship in epcot in 1994 because disney and mattel realized that barbie is sort of this this uh ambassador of many cultures throughout the years and Mattel had, you know, sponsored things like um, It's a Small World and whatnot. So they created this 20-minute show at the America Gardens Theater. They remodeled the theater. Look, the reason why you have a covered clamshell now at the theater, you can thank Barbie, right? Thank you, Barbie. You're welcome. So this debuted in Thanksgiving. um, Actually, wait, it debuted. Okay, it debuted on thanks in Thanksgiving 1993. How long before it closed for an update? 94. No, the next day. The there next was, day. It literally showed for <laughs> one day and they're like, ah, wait a minute. We need to rewrite. And it's so if you saw the magical world of Barbie on opening day, you're the only people on the planet that have ever done it because it was a different show the next day. Um, they put video clips from this in the Christmas parade. There were uh, Mattel uh, videos. There was also the Magical World. There was some other like Barbie's birthday party like video. You can, I think you can still find it online somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, you, I yeah, you need to sort of. You need to you need to this, see it to this, believe it. This is this is awesome. She came in a pink limousine. There were doves. There were pyrotechnics. Uh, there was all kinds of stuff going on with this show. But she had this. Her limousine was originally Mickey's limousine. It was Mickey's limousine, which was created for his 60th oh, wait, birthday. Sorry. 
Sorry. <laughs> I'm watching the video. <laughs> don't don't watch it. Shield your eyes, boy. Um, yeah, you're looking for something fun to do with the kids. You need to watch the magical world of Barbie show. And then when you're done with that, I'm going to go fast because not that we're short on time because we could talk forever. If you like the magical world of Barbie show, you're going to love the circus. Because do you remember when there was a circus in Epcot Center, specifically the Epcot Center Daredevil Circus Spectacular? Disney World proudly presents Epcot's Daredevil Circus Spectacular. And now, the commander of the space transport who has brought all of the intergalactic stars and daredevils from the distant reaches of the universe, the master of the rings of space, welcome Commander Starser! Dun, dun, dun! It, it ran in, um... 1987. If you're looking, if you're still looking, it's like, I swear I'm not dreaming this. These things actually existed. This was, and I quote, a cosmic thrill show like no other circus in the universe. And they, I think they probably said it in that kind of voice too. That was awesome. Thank you. There were elephants. So- there were real oh. elephants in Epcot Center. There were acrobats, <laughs> motorcyclists, a tightrope walker over like the middle, like by the fountain. There was, and you have to do it with the voice, the Wheel of Destiny. The like, Wheel of Exactly. Destiny. Are you confused? <clears throat> so are we. So, um, wow. yeah. And so I think my only guess has to be was, again, maybe this came from an Eisner thing. Like, look, we need to lighten the tone of Epcot. We need to attract kids. Hey, what are kids like? They like, oh, they like the circus. Get make me a circus. <laughs> You're a circus. So, um, yeah, it was um, it was very interesting. Uh, again, you can probably find some video clips there. And oh, if you, they're out there. And if you think that's gonna freak you out, you need to go and look. I'm not kidding. I'm you looking. need to Hold go on. and find um, the Epcot pageant dolls. Right. So. These were, I'm trying to figure out how to describe them. When Epcot Center first opened, um, they had oh, dear. these. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't oh, unsee. <laughs> you can't... Oh, that's not. That's unfortunate. <laughs> you can't unsee it. But basically, there were these characters, these people of the world characters that were seen and featured in the uh, opening day parade and a few of the other parades. And they were basically giant walking dolls that had these monstrous heads. Um, They're like bobbleheads. Right. From so if you remember the, the old America on Parade, which was the Bicentennial Parade from Magic Kingdom, they took those guys, gave them a little costume change, and had them sort of roam around the promenade um, originally as part of the, so if you watch the Danny Kaye opening, uh, Epcot Center opening on TV, you can find them there. Um, It was a very, very short-lived, I don't, was it an experiment? Was it, I don't know what it was, but yeah. Wait. I want to do a, and see now, see now, now I really should do a a totally separate show on weird Epcot because do you remember? Wait. <laughs> yeah, this, you're veering way, way I know, down from. But these uh, are top. Mo- uh, Tim, these are top moments. Do you remember? <laughs> wait. Yeah. Do you remember the Christos? Wait. Were they the the futuristic acrobats? Yes, they were. They weren't just acrobats. Yes, I remember that. I was. They were contortionists. They were <laughs> so they were. They were. They were. They were. Yeah. Right. So they had. Wait, so if you remember, so the Christos were a future world act in Epcot yeah. that were, I, I want to say, late 90s, early aughts. 
early mm. thousands, whatever they call them. You can it's Christos K R I S T O S. They were performers in these sort of semi-reflective, dark gray, full body spandex costumes with these trippy alien faces. Later on, they took the alien faces off and they exposed their faces, whew, thankfully, because they were haunting, to say the least. Uh, it, they were wonderfully, incredibly talented. Don't know how they fit into Epcot being futuristic, other than they were wearing some sort of futuristic looking Buck Rogers in the 25th century spandex, but they were the Christos. And I think they were there till 2007 or something. Are you looking? Are you just? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm Look, there's one with the Epcot wand right in the background. That's that's beautiful. I I really. I'm still enamored with these. uh, These dolls. I want to make. I'm going to make one of you. Duh! I please, 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 please. But look, no, it would be so. I mean, it can, it can, it can sit with me at dinner. Look, and and I would. I would be remiss if talking about milestones and moments and significant things, again, being a nerd, as long as we were talking about characters, I, I just thought of this, and by this, I mean these. Do you remember Smart One, Cutie One, and Digit, and some of the other robots that used to inhabit Epcot Center? So Smart One was in com- in Communicore. Remember, he was the little purple robot. You may have a, a, a vinylmation of him. Welcome to Epcot Center. An unbelievable showcase of great nations and 21st century innovations. This is Future World. Here you can travel through time and space and imagination, find the future and touch tomorrow. You are looking at Spaceship Earth. 180 feet tall, the only geosphere on Earth. Once inside, you can ride through time, tracing man's means of communication. There was also that really big, I I don't remember what the designation one. It was this other robot that had this gigantic saucer-shaped head that used to go around and interact and talk to guests. Sort of the precursors to things like push. Um, But there was a lot of robotic presence in, in Epcot Center at one point, and then they all just sort of disappeared, probably because of the fear of the Terminator-like apocalypse. <laughs> Turtle Talk with Crush is going to be like Patient Zero, and it's just going to expand from there. Oh, no. <laughs> well, fine, you, did. you really took us down a... You Sorry. think I'm the go-with here, guy. <laughs> you took... I Listen, I this started is... talking about characters, I'm... and then... Look, well, I, again... I, I was thinking historical I didn't date a lot... moments like significant in the, in Walt Disney World history and we ended up with World Showcase bobblehead dolls. They're absolutely creeping sig- me out. You are right. I cannot unsee what I'm looking at right now. <laughs> this is going to I mean But I these mean, are sorry, but I, these I, are I, milestone some of these moments. Very good idea. I don't want to. I, I I will I will I, argue that these are milestone moments because I think they represent a significant either turning points in Epcot history or uh, uh, maybe starting to usher in something that was new and something that was different. Um, Maybe because they were hallmark attractions that are no longer here or introduced new technology. Um, Yes, I will make the argument for the Astuter Computer (laughs) review all day long. Maybe not so much the Christos or splashtacular um but then i i I did i I went off the rails a little bit but uh but look (laughs) barbie's birthday party is a milestone right because again it It, was this absolutely continuing shush listen it was this continuing idea of we need this feeling that we needed to bring in characters younger look it's been an issue for epcot since day one how do we not only bring in younger guests who are not just being brought in by their parents who are curious to see these attractions that are educational about the future and technology but how do we find something that's make the kids going to say hey i want to go see epcot and if we need to use barbie as the sort of gateway character to do it then so be it and so barbie too helped usher in what we are seeing now with Finding Nemo, Ratatouille, Guardians of the Galaxy, you can thank Barbie for that too. 
Barbie. So things I thought I would never talk about <laughs> on a WWE radio show. Barbie, Ken Jennings, um, yeah. spandex aliens, and circuses. Bobblehead dolls. I, I never even got to the, the stilt birds either. So or Captain EO. I was I was gonna go up and the robots, but yeah. I was sure you were gonna go down a dream finder path at some point and you surprised me. I was going to, but I would have gone down. But Look, you think I went off on a tangent it now? Started. But I did. I mean, I sort of I talked about when, I, and really, I I mentioned them in terms of where I started, right? In terms of no Mickey in Epcot Center, and how Dreamfinder and Figment were supposed to be. And again, it was a year later, but the idea was they were going to be the ambassadors and the mascots of Epcot. And I think that's coming. I think what we're going to see as we turn the page to, you know, 2020 and beyond, you know, one thing we didn't see at D23 Expo 2019 and when we were talking about the future of Epcot was any mention of the Imagination Pavilion and Figment specifically. He's all over the merch. There's new plush. He's at Food and Wine Festival in, in terms of, of characters. There's Funko Pops. The future is Figment. The future of Epcot Center is going to be Figment. So when that happens, we will do a much deeper dive. And I invite you to go back and listen to my interview with Ron Schneider, the original Dream Finder. We did a DSI, Disney Seed Investigation of Journey into Imagination. So... Figment has a long and storied and very interesting history, but I think the future of Epcot is, is Figment. I'm all about the Figment. I love the Figment. The I Raven. won't. Don't even Every... get me talking about. I don't want to get you started. Don't but... get me started on Captain Salty Hinder. I won't. I kid you not. It's a real thing. And there you go. <laughs> Captain Salty Hinder was a real thing. What was, what was that all about? Luke? Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Captain, ah, listen, what? that's a tease for a future episode of the show and a future top 10. But I want to know, I think Tim does too. We want to know, know from you, what for you is your favorite milestone or important or magical moment in Epcot Center history? It could be personal, it could be a subjective thing to you. It could be more of an objective type of moment in Epcot's history. There's a couple of different ways you could let me know. The best way is to go to our Box People group on Facebook. So just go to www.radio.com slash community. That's where the community and conversation exists. You can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. Leave a voicemail. Let us know. I'll play it on the show. Or you can send me an email at lou at www.radio.com. But I would love to have the conversation in the Facebook group. And then... As long as you're on the internet and you fired up your AOL with your dial-up 14.4 baud modem, you should go to celebrationspress.com because I know there's all kinds of great stuff that Tim is going to tell us in 30 seconds that's happening there. (laughs) Yeah, there's some magazine, but you say people don't read those anymore. No, it's not what I said. Yes, you did. (laughs) You did. No, no, it's funny. So, yeah, celebrations. uh, Our next issue is coming up. Whatever. But, but we have bigger news, Lou. I don't know if I did this on the last show, if this was out yet. Our new free, absolutely free, I think I meant to send you this link, wdwmonthly.com, or you can uh, visit at celebrationspress.com. It's our new free monthly digital magazine. It's totally free. There's no strings. We're going to bring you, we have been bringing you the Disney, Magic of Disney every month in an all new way with our new digital magazine. This is above and beyond what's in celebration, so it's like an extra bit of Disney magic out there for you. And it's funny you mentioned um, Mickey, uh, astronaut Mickey, from the from the days of Epcot, because we also have uh, launched wdwcupcakes.com where we celebrate all the sweetness of Disney and all the good things. And it's funny you mention that because our video blogger baker natty just made a video um commemorating illuminations and actually I, i'd be remiss if, and not saying september 30th 2019 very significant date i've got history as that being the last showing of illuminations but she made a uh, commemorative 
Cupcake for Illuminations taking inspiration from Mickey's astronaut rainbow suit. What? I, I kid you not. And she pulled the sheet. It, it's, I, it's a, <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's a great thing to see. I, she, she mentioned it on the video and I went, wait, what are you talking about? And then, yep. So if you go, if you check out www.cupcakes.com, you can check out our videos. And that's one of them. It's funny you mentioned that. And I found, I pulled up an old picture. There's Mickey Mouse in his astronaut space suit with a big rainbow, sparkly glittering all over it. And uh, all kinds of stuff there. And you can also check out, we have a Haunted Mansion Cupcakes pin that we just released. So that's good. There's all kinds of goodness that we have going on there. Well, all you, you can, need to do... You can start your journey at celebrationspress.com and go from there. That's the easiest place to start. And you can find out all the goodness we have. Again, celebrationspress.com is is like the rabbit hole we just went to from Epcot yep. Center. That's right. Um, <laughs> lots of goodness over there. Lots of goodness with you, little Timmy Foster dude. I love and appreciate yeah. you. These are always fun. Dare I say somewhat interesting, getting a really deep, interesting look into the mind of Timmy Foster or what it, what little learned, there is left of, of it. I've learned more about you in the past hour than I really Again, don't ask know, questions but, you don't uh, want to know the answers to. But we would also love to hear your thoughts and suggestions for possible top tens in the future again, as well. Again, best way to let me know is to email me, lou at www.radio.com and or post it in the group on Facebook and little Timmy Foster take us out in song your favorite sing your favorite Epcot Center song go uh, no 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 you no see no. my friend come on no no do it for the Sherman Brothers out, if you're gonna hold out on the people do it for the Shermans I'm not gonna be your are you saying you don't I, you don't I, love I Richard Sherman find, by the way I cannot find this computer thing you're talking about on my Spotify a lie. It's. I, I will tell you. It. Check on the YouTube's. Look on the YouTube's. <laughs> One little spark is all you need to go and have some. Okay. And, <laughs> and on that horrific note. <laughs> Saves me time and headaches too. He sorts things out, analyzes in a shake. My enormous problem to him's a piece of cake. He's got a great big memory like an elephant. <laughs> Utilizes knowledge without end. That's why I'm a router for me computer. Everybody needs a friend. <laughs> when my work piles up and I'm seeing red, cause I need five arms and an extra head, I find the computer becomes me troubleshooter. He keeps miles and miles of facts on file. My wish is his command. Nothing is astuter than a computer when I need a helping hand. Let me explain. They keep on top of accommodations, record and update reservations, coordinate telephone operations, and help plan energy conservation. They're really a great financial device. Payroll service is kept precise. They project attendance, then give advice on personnel, food, and merchandise. They're... It's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details, sometimes know what you see, hear, yes, maybe even taste. And if you think you know the answer, you can enter via our online form for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Of course, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I asked you a simple question during our live walkabout and review of the oh-so-very-delicious Epcot International Food and Wine Festival, and I asked you to tell me where's the line Hunky Tuna Tostada from? So I not only have to thank you for entering, but really for some of the oh-so-very creative and funny. I think I like reading some of the wrong answers more than I like reading the correct ones, but a lot of you entered, got this one correct, and knew that it was from the Enchanted Tiki Room under new management. So if you recall, near the end of the attraction, Iago and Zazu are talking back and forth. Iago says how the place is going to be a gold mine and there's no more worries. And Zazu laughs and says, well, that's where I come from. It's called Hakuna Matata. Iago goes, 
hunky tuna tostada? What a stupid phrase, but it's okay. They call each other friends, they move on, and eventually under new management closes down. But anyway, I took all of the correct entries, randomly selected one, and again, last week you were playing for all of my digital products, which are my Walt Disney World audio tours. I have seven walking tours of the history, secrets, stories, and details of all the lands in the Magic Kingdom, 102 ways to save money for that Walt Disney World book, a WW Radio vinyl sticker, a WW Radio pop socket, and a WW Radio t-shirt. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Brian Cantrell. So Brian, you use the online form. I have your shipping address. I will get your prize package out to right away. But if you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So on the first floor of the Walt Disney World Railroad Station in Magic Kingdom, you'll find a train bulletin hanging on the wall, which I think really is a true hidden treasure, and it's full of great references and Easter eggs in there. Because on that board, you'll find the arriving and departing train schedule, and each row pays subtle homage to a number of different Disney films and characters, as well as Disney legends and train aficionados. And one of the destinations is Pendergast Plains. That's a tribute to what or who? So tell me, who or what is Pendergast Plains a tribute to on the first floor of the Walt Disney World Railroad Station in Magic Kingdom? Now you have until Sunday, October 13th at 11.59 p.m. to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the online forum there. Now, I might actually end up giving you a couple of extra days to enter only because I will be traveling to Japan and I might be a little delayed in getting the show out. So I'll give you a little bit of leeway with the entry date. But you are going to play for all the digital products, the books, the seven audio tours, the vinyl sticker, the pop socket, the shirt. And you know what? I'm also going to throw in a mystery prize. It could be something from D23 Expo. I've got some cool stuff from Imagineering, some limited edition merchandise there. Maybe it's something from Galaxy's Edge. Maybe it's something from the archives in the prize closet. That's why it's called the mystery. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so very much for taking the time to tune in and join me this and every week. And I invite and would love for you to please join me over the next two weeks from October 11th through the 25th. I'll be on our WDW Radio Adventures by Disney group trip through Japan. And I will be sharing that journey with you on social. So follow me, please. I am at Lou Mangiello on Twitter. I'll be doing a lot on Instagram. I'm Instagram.com slash Lou Mangiello. On Facebook, make sure you like the WW Radio Facebook page. More importantly, join the community at www.radio.com slash community. I'll be posting different content in different places. I'll also be going live on Facebook, Instagram stories, as well as photo posts on Instagram as well. We'll be in Osaka, Kyoto, Takayama, Hakone, Tokyo, and then, of course, Tokyo Disneyland and Disney Sea. I'd love for you to come along with us and share in the fun and the culture and, of course, the food. I promise I'll eat enough for all of us. Get ready, Japan. I'm coming for you. Call the ocean. You're going to need more tuna. Huge thanks to all the members of the WW Radio Nation family. I'd love to welcome and thank some of the new and longtime members of the nation, including Josh Anderson, Ned Hebert, Debbie Skurka, Branstetter, Brian Campbell, Angela Jones, Kevin Cooper, Kimberly Linkletter, Aaron Morgan, Gwyn Cornell, and Michael Hull. I sincerely appreciate and I'm grateful to and for you. And if you want to find out how you can help the show and also receive exclusive rewards every month, each month I can create a new Walt Disney World or Disneyland or Disney Cruise Line scavenger hunt. We have a private Facebook group, custom Magic Band covers, logo gear, t-shirts, backpacks, care packages from Walt Disney World, exclusive live video group calls every month, as well as early access and discounts to special events. To find out more, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. And please don't forget that a portion of the proceeds of your contributions do go to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. Again, to find out more, visit www.radio.com slash support. And speaking of community and really family, again, I invite you to join our Box People group on Facebook at www.radio.com slash community. That is where the conversation takes place. Please come by. It's a very fun, family-friendly, welcoming community. 
and come by, introduce yourself, and be part of the conversation. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. Again, I'm at Lou Mangello on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, as well as on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on the air, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com, or call the voicemail. will be heard on the air at 407-900-9391. And of course, as much as I love talking with you and having conversations online, you know I believe that nothing beats a handshake and a hug. It's why I continue to do monthly meetups in Walt Disney World and on the road. Thanks to everybody who came by our Flash WW Radio meet and live show this past Wednesday in Disney Springs. For November, I am going to be traveling again. I'm going to do a meetup in the UK as I travel to speak. But I think we're going to do a meetup over Wine and Dine weekend, which is the first weekend of November, that weekend of November 1st. Stay tuned to the events page over at www.radio.com slash events for the exact time and location, as well as our UK meetup and other meetups on the road and a few other things I have planned that I'm just not ready to share and announce as yet. Uh, speaking of thanks, I want to say huge thanks as always to Becky Menken and the entire team over at MouseFanTravel.com. They are my official and recommended travel provider for all of your vacation planning needs, whether it's a Disney destination or anywhere on the planet. I use them. More importantly, I trust and recommend them because they give you the incredible levels of service that we've come to expect when we go to a Disney destination as well as all available discounts, and it all comes at no cost to you. You can visit them at mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tell your friends to come and listen, and more importantly, be part of the community and family. Tweet out that you're listening. Share a link to this or your favorite episode on Facebook. And if you can, take just 30 seconds to rate and review the show over on iTunes. It's incredibly helpful. Another great way to help spread the word. I want to thank some recent reviewers like Just TP, who says, Making the miles more merry in my job. I spent a lot of hours staring through a windshield asking myself, Are we there yet? Are we there yet? For the longest time, I depended on satellite radio to help pass the hours. At the suggestion of my 20-year-old son, I started listening to podcasts as an alternative. I'm so glad that I did, and I found WW Radio and Lou. I always know that no matter how my day is gone, I can count on Lou's positive tone and outlook to lift me up. It's not that he always has unicorns and rainbows about all things Disney, but even when there's negative aspects to the topic, he doesn't present them with a negative tone. That hasn't always been my experience with other Disney podcasts. Even past Disney, I really appreciate Lou's very clear messages of being the best you, having your best week ever, and loving what you do. To be honest, these can all be struggles for me, but every time I hear him discuss personal excellence... I feel more encouraged to keep on climbing. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Just TP. DWK the second says WW Radio is one of the best Disney podcasts out there, especially from an edu infotainment perspective. Lou has a wealth of knowledge about the Disney parks. I don't get out much, and he shares that information freely. Definitely a must listen for any fan of the Walt Disney World Resort and the restaurants therein. Uh, e Van Quill says it's not your average Disney podcast. I've been listening to WW Radio for a few years now, and it's crazy that I've never left a review before. I can't recommend this podcast more highly for any Disney fan. It's absolutely amazing and a must if you love Disney. Lewis, it's a profound way of connecting with others and truly making you feel like you're part of this huge, wonderful Disney family that he has created. And remember, you guys created it. I just built the clubhouse. Uh, his genuine love of what he does oozes through the oozes <laughs> through the podcast, not to mention the Facebook group, Instagram, and videos. It's so much more than a podcast. It's a life-changing com- wow, it's a life-changing community. Lose a very rare gem in this world and it'll absolutely inspire you to be the best person you can be. Conquer your fear of following your dreams and get the things accomplished you've always just seen as a pipe dream. At the very least, the podcast is just a fantastic way to make you feel as though you're sitting with him and his guests inside the parks talking about our favorite things about Walt Disney World and beyond. WW Radio and Lou, especially our bright rays of sunshine in this sometimes gloomy world that's guaranteed to bring joy into your life every single day. Aaron, DWK, and Just TP, thank you all so, so very much. I sincerely appreciate such kind words. Again, I just built the clubhouse. You are the guys that populate it and make it such an amazing place. Again, to leave a review, just search for WW Radio on iTunes or go to www.radio.com slash iTunes. I show you exact instructions on how and where to, li- to leave a review. And again, thank you so much, not just for taking your time, which I know is so incredibly valuable to you, and sharing it and spending it with me and spreading the word about the show to other people. And more importantly, 
for giving me the gift of being able to do what I love and share it with you every single day in so many different ways. I cannot express the gratitude that I have to and for you. And if there's some way that I can pay that back or pay it forward, please let me know how I can help you or somebody else. And even though I might not be able to say it to you directly every single day, I'm thankful for you every single day. I am very hyper aware of that. And you have to remember to always be grateful for what you have and then work hard because it's the only way to work. Work hard for what you don't. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I truly hope that this is your best week ever. I love and appreciate you so very much. So until next time, see ya. Hi, Lou. This is Amy from Woodbridge, New Jersey, but not for long. I'm following your advice from your relocation podcast, and we're making the move to Florida. Um, I'm a former CP, so I've been trying to get back ever since. Um, We're not moving to Orlando. We're moving to Tampa, but everything kind of fell in place with our Disney World vacation next week, Um, and we're moving tomorrow. So thanks for all the great tips from the relocation um, episode. And I hope to see you in a meet in month. Thanks. Bye. Hi, Lou. Uh, this is Joe Anderson from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I couldn't help but uh, call in and tell you about my memories of something that is no longer at Walt Disney World. And one of them, you and Timmy actually talked a little bit about. Actually, I take that back. It was actually you and Becky. And that was at Disney's MGM Studios when they had the Backlot Tour. And you were talking about the Bumblebee, how uh, they did the video where you would sit on a Bumblebee and then they would film it and then they would show you what it would really look like in real life when you did it in front of a green screen. My wife and I did that tour and at the beginning of it, you had an opportunity to film a fight scene in the Navy. And so they would have people that would put on rain year and you would stand at uh, at me for instance I was standing inside the uh, captain's uh, control of a uh, or the deck I guess you would say the ship's deck of a battleship and then I would be shot at and so I would stand there and you know have all these bullets and everything coming at me of course it was all movie magic and then there would be this flood of water that would hit and so you had all this rain gear and on everything and they would you know flood the water and the the machine guns that make the water spray and all that so my wife and I actually got to do that and it was one of the coolest things ever we still have the VHS tape of it and so I just want to let you know you guys were not too far off base that yes they did do that we got to participate in the battleship scene but we did watch them do the uh, the honey I shrunk the kid when they flew on the bumblebee scene so anyway thanks Lou for all you do love your show so much and uh, thanks again Hi, Lou. It's Elizabeth from Massachusetts. I haven't called in for a little bit now. Um, but I just wanted to wish every person who's a teacher or has a kid who's going to school or who is a listener and a kid uh, a very happy school year. I met off to my first um, day myself on Wednesday morning at 6.30 in the morning, which feels way too early in August to be heading anywhere. But... Yes, I hope everyone has a magical school year. Um, make it great, everybody. And, yeah, you have 180 days to learn something new or to learn a lot of things new. So thanks for all the work you do, Lou. I just finished listening to up to 233 about the Swiss Family Treehouse, uh, which was one of my favorite movies growing up. Um, I've always loved it. So thanks for doing that and all the work you do. So, yep, everyone have an awesome school year. Um, wishing everyone the best and a very happy Wednesday. Bye, guys. Have an awesome day. Hey, Lou. Long time lost box original member here calling for the first time. Little things that I miss. Water skiing Goofy. The Living Seas Diving Mickey Mouse. The Air Force One Balloon. And last but certainly not least, the absolutely fabulous Breathless. Have a magical day. Hey, Lou. It's Christine Morrison from Flower Town, PA. I'm out doing my rounds this morning, and I just wanted to tell you that I um, am listening backwards, and I just finished listening to your 100th episode back from January 4th, 2009. And 
is, the only thing I have to say is, WDW Radio helps my Disney knowledge grow. Hosted by Lou Mangiello is my favorite podcast show. Love that song. Anyway, it's the only podcast show that I listen to. So, um, I'm down to 99. It's taken me a little over two years, but I think I will be finishing podcast hopefully this year. So also I just want to let you guys know I've been listening to Lou quite a lot. He joins me in the car all the time. He just doesn't know it. Have a great week, the rest of your week, uh, Thursday morning. Make somebody smile. See you guys later. Good luck this weekend at the Disney Expo. Can't wait to see some posts. Yay! Bye. Good morning, Lou Mangiello and WDW Radio Box family and WDW Radio Nation and WDW Radio Runner. Everybody have a wonderful, fabulous weekend. Exclamation point because guess what? We've got the end of Illuminations this weekend and the beginning of Epcot Forever. Looking really forward to it. I know everybody is sad. I am sad as well, but I know that change has to come into play. And I know that Lou has a lot going on this weekend. He's got momentum. He just had the indie meet. He's got Japan coming up and then New Orleans. Oh, there's just so much going on. And we are going to have so much new news coming into our future, I think. Have a fabulous weekend again. Love and hugs. This is Darlene Maggie from Davenport, Florida.